I'm pleased to introduce you to Emily Bridges, who is the registered dietitian for Harvard University Dining Services. Emily, take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Um, so today I wanted to kind of go over um, what I like to call complete proteins and then uh, proteins in general, how much you need. And then we'll get into our recipe, which is one of my favorites. It's a black bean and sweet potato stew. Um, okay, so protein. So protein is found throughout our body. It's in our skin, it's in our hair, uh, it's in the muscle that we have. It's also comprises enzymes and hemoglobin in our blood. So it serves a lot of really vital functions in our body. Um, and it's pretty important to have in your diet. Um, so proteins are made up of amino acids. They're kind of the building blocks of a protein. And there's 20 in total that make up protein. Um, so nine of these are um, essential, meaning that our body doesn't make them. So we're not able to produce them ourselves. Now the other um, 11 our body can make ourselves. So we don't have to get them um, from food in our diet, but the nine we do have to consume um, from food. So the complete proteins would contain all of the nine essential amino acids, the ones that we need because we can't make them ourselves. So meat and dairy and egg are complete proteins. Um, so these are obviously mostly animal products. There are a few exceptions uh, for plant proteins that are complete proteins, which I'll go over um, in a little bit. Okay, so complete proteins. Um, I mentioned before, a lot of them are um, animal based, but the non meat based ones that you can find are uh, quinoa. Um, I include egg and dairy as kind of a non meat based one. Um, soy, amaranth, buckwheat, hemp, chia, spirulina. These all contain the um, nine essential amino acids, so they're considered a complete protein. And then for every other food um, that you're trying to make into a complete protein, I like to follow the formula of a legume plus a grain, a nut, or a seed. So a legume would be like a bean, a peanut. The grain would be um, a whole wheat bread or a rice, um, nuts or seeds obviously could also complete that kind of equation. So you could have a legume and then plus something that contains a grain or a nut or a seed. And these don't need to be eaten all at one meal. Um, so you really wanna look at your diet in the span of a whole day and don't worry too much about Kind of an individual meal. Um, the body creates protein over a 24-hour period, not every time you eat. So um, as long as you have the complementary proteins um, in the same day, like say you have a piece of bread for breakfast and then you have some peanut butter for lunch, that's going to be your complete protein for the day. Um, so the body's going to use utilize it all the same. So things like um, beans and rice, um, peanut butter on a sandwich, like that's obviously some of the classics that we think of. Um, and they're not only delicious, but they're also a complete protein, so works out pretty well. Um, so how much protein do you actually need to eat? Um, so you would think with all the emphasis on protein from like manufacturers, you know, we have the protein waffle mixes and the protein cereals and the protein bars and shakes um, that we need a lot of protein or that it's this magical macronutrient um, that we're really deficient in. And while it is especially useful um, for people like athletes and for older adults, the average American who's just, you know, going to work, who's exercising occasionally, who is living just their, you know, normal average, average everyday life, they don't really need all that much to be healthy and to be functioning properly. Um, so the recommendation is for 0.8, it's a little convoluted, but we'll get into it. Um, the recommendation is for 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. Um, so in order to get a, um, for some of you, kilogram might be something that you're familiar with, but for a lot of Americans, um, you know, we go by pounds. So to get your kilogram weight, you would divide your pounds by 2.2 and then multiply that number by 0.8 to get your protein needs for the day. So 155 pound person um, is about 70.45 kilograms times 0.8, that's about 56 grams of protein a day, which when you think about it really um, isn't that much. So um, it's really not something that you need to worry about too much, um, especially in America where we have a really meat heavy diet. Um, consuming excess protein doesn't, you know, magically build muscle or, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything magic. Excess protein that's not stored in our body, it's, it's not stored. We have no 
mechanism in our body to actually store protein. So it's just going to get converted to energy or to fat. So there's really nothing magical about it. Um, so if you can consume more than your um, more protein than your body needs, then you're just going to, it's going to be utilized elsewhere. It's going to be stored as fat. So there's really nothing kind of mythical about it. Um, it just is another energy source that your body might use if it doesn't use it to build muscle or to make enzymes, that kind of thing. Um, so you, for older adults and athletes might require a little bit more. So like one gram to 1.5 gram per kilogram. But again, that's for probably people over the age of 60 just to prevent lean muscle mass. And then for athletes, and these are like serious athlete, athletes that are training uh, multiple times a week um, for hours a day. So uh, for, again, for the average American, you wouldn't need to go that high. And then if you wanna look at in terms of percentage wise for a, a whole diet, um, it's a pretty wide range. So it's 10 to 35% of, of total calories for the day. Um, so you can you know, go as low as 10% or 35%. And I think that just kind of shows you um, how variable it can be. But no one really knows exactly what the perfect amount of protein is, but there is a wide range. And I think that just goes to show that you can consume a, a little or you consume a little bit more, um, but you're gonna be healthy regardless. So there's no real um, specific um, kind of percentage wise that they put on for total calories. And then if you wanted to kind of do the math that way, there's about four calories in a gram of protein. So a 2000 calorie diet, that's about 25% protein would contain 125 grams of protein um, because there's 500. So 500 calories is 25% of 2000 divided by four is 125 grams. Um, so I, I, the really, I think the biggest part, and I think what a lot of research has shown is that it's not really the amount of protein that you're eating unless it's really, really low and which you're, you know, um, maybe because you're not eating enough, but in general, you want to look at the source of protein because that seems to be the most important for health implications. So red meat being something that's a little bit more detrimental on health than plant-based sources of protein. Um, in general, you want to consider the entire package of, of, of the protein that you're eating. You want to look at it for the fat and the sodium because you can have something that you, you know, it's really high in protein and you think this is great for me, but it, maybe it's a burger and it's full of also saturated fat and um, other things that you don't really want in your diet on an everyday basis. Um, and then, so plant proteins are something, you know, not only for health-wise, just because they are packed with a lot of fiber and other unsaturated fats and um, phytochemicals that are really good for health, they're also really eco-friendly. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a happy coincidence that healthy sources of protein are also really environmentally um, sustainable. So our, our, you know, our legumes, our wheat, those are things that are going to have um, a lot less um, greenhouse gas emissions than something like, especially red meats. So you think about lamb, you think about beef. These have a lot of input in terms of water, in terms of land usage. Um, so um, it's kind of just nice that you can get a really um, a sustainable, also economical and healthy source of protein from um, plant-based proteins. Um, and the Eat Lancet Commission, which was a, a commission that did a lot of research on, it's in Harvard itself um, with Harvard researchers, but they recommend lemonade red meat consumption to something like one hamburger per week or less. And that's, you know, a diet that's sustainable for the environment, but also really healthy for you as well. And then I wanted to add um, just a final kind of snippet about soy. Um, so I get a lot of questions. I've always gotten a lot of questions at that about soy since I've been a dietitian, especially from women, um, but also from men, just because they, you know, they hear a lot of concerns about um, estrogen. And soy does contain a plant form of estrogen uh, called a phytoestrogen. It's found in the isoflavones. And these can bind to estrogen receptors in humans. Um, but I think what a lot of people don't know is that they can have both um, estrogenic, meaning they promote the expression of estrogen or anti-estrogenic properties. Um, so, you know, either way you look at it, I'll, as I'll get into it a little bit, but it's kind of complicated in the way that it works. So there can also be really positive implications of eating soy because if you have anti-estrogenic properties, even though it is weak, it can theoretically um, kind of reduce the risk of breast cancer because the estrogen stimulates the growth and the multiplication of the breast, can breast cancer cells. Um, and so a lot of research that you see um, you just want to keep a few things in mind when you're hearing kind of some of the claims about soy. So a lot of the experiment, experiments are um, based in mice. So 
Obviously, um, a, a mice differs a lot from a human in terms of the metabolic pathways. So it's a little bit different to kind of totally extrapolate that data to humans. Um, and there's also a lot of different ways that they introduce soy into the, the mouse. So it's not only from eating, but some of them they will actually inject soy isolate into the, the mouse. So it's kind of it offshoots normal metabolic pathways. So again, it's hard to kind of draw a lot of conclusions from that. Um, so just important to keep in mind when you're thinking about this stuff. And also, soy can have different effects on people of different ethnicities. So um, in terms of soy metabolism, oops, sorry, in terms, of, in terms of soy metabolism, whenever it reaches your small intestine and it starts to uh, interact with your intestinal bacteria, it produces a compound um, that makes it easier for the body to kind of reap some of the benefits that we see from soy. But not everyone and not every ethnicity can produce this compound. It's called s equal. It's more often found in the guts of actually people that live in Asian countries, um, which in general, they tend to eat soy at a much younger age. They also tend to eat a lot more of it. Um, and in general, a lot of the research, again, is based in Asian populations where they eat a lot less red meat than their Western counterparts. They also eat more fresh vegetables. They're more physically active. So there's a lot of kind of confounding variables that it, it makes it a little bit difficult difficult to disentangle. And then, as I mentioned before, um, where how the soy is in, gets into our body is a, is a big thing to think about. And a lot of this research, they use um, extracts or they use isolates um, that in high doses, especially probably more than you would ever eat, um, can tend to stimulate breast cancer growth. Um, but whenever you think about it in terms of a food product, so like to tofu or tempeh, which is fermented soy, you really don't see those effects um, as much. And then the final bit, which makes it even a little bit more complicated, is that um, women with breast cancer, so they have you know negative, there's um, hormone positive or hormone negative breast cancer types, and these actually react differently to soy intake as well. Um, and it even is different in postmenopausal versus premenopausal women. So um, uh, there was a study in China, um, again, you know, hard to extrapolate because it's a different population, but still um, there was a 28% decreased risk of hormone positive breast cancer in postmenopausal women, but a 54% decreased risk of hormone negative breast cancer in premenopausal women. So there's a lot of kind of um, intricacies in that that you have to think about. Um, so whenever people ask me, like, do you recommend soy? Like, do you recommend, you know, me eating this every day? Um, it, it's hard to say yes or no, because I don't know all of these impacts on your life. But in general, I think soy, especially in the form of like edamame, tofu, soy milk, like whole uh, soy products, it's really a nutrient dense food that gives you not only, um, you know, a complete source of protein, but lots of fiber and phytonutrients as well. Um, and a lot of research has really shown if anything, soy has protective effects for things like cancer and cardiovascular disease. So, um, you know, if you want to add it into your diet every now and again, it's really not something I would worry about at all. Um, and that's my little spiel on soy because I really like tofu and I'm very protective of it. Okay. Um, so let's get cooking. Okay. Can you see my pot? Yes, we can see your pot. Yeah. Okay, now you can see it. So this is on about a medium heat. I'm just heating up my oil that I'm going to use to um, cook all of my vegetables in. So I have um, sweet potato, I have a uh, bell pepper, uh, red onion, there's garlic in here. There's also a jalapeno. I actually used a red jalapeno instead of a green one. Um, and But the jalapenos, if you want it to be um, spicier, you can leave some of the seeds in. Um, um, you can leave some of the seeds in, just because that's where a lot of the capsaicin is. Um, so I'm just going to turn it on in here a little bit, because I might have turned it up a little bit too high. Um, so 
And it's such a colorful recipe. Also why I really like this recipe. I'll go over a lot of stuff about vegetables. I mean, we all know that they're, you know, supposed to be amazing for us, but there's a lot to them. And, you know, they're all, they're so colorful, which just means that they have so many different types of phytonutrients and, and, and pigments in them that gives, um, gives us a lot of good nutrients and minerals. So this has all of the colors of the rainbow, which I think is great. So I'm just going to cook this until um, they kind of start to soften a little bit and they get fragrant. And I just realized I forgot to um, put in the curry paste. Um, so it's fine. It happens. I'm just going to add it now. It's still going to taste good, I promise. So I'm adding the curry paste. It's just a red curry paste um, and some cinnamon. And just, I'm just going to mix it all in there. A question to you, would you use your oil? What? Uh, could you leave the peel on the sweet potato? Yeah, thanks for reminding me. That was actually something I wanted to talk about. Um, so the peel obviously has a lot of fiber, um, lots of other nutrients in there. So you could, some people don't like the texture, so I left it off for this one. And they, whenever they break down, they're gonna be, um, it's gonna get a little bit creamier because they don't have the peel on them keeping it together. Um, but I save the peels because I like to bake them at like 400 degrees and make like sweet potato um, chips with the skin, which is really good. Um, there's no point in wasting them. But yeah, you could totally keep it, keep them on and it would be just as good. So we just want to keep it, um, cook this until it's a little bit softer. You should start to really um, smell it whenever it starts to heat up so you kind of know that you're, it's, it's a very um, strong smell, which I really like a lot. It smells really good with the curry paste and the cinnamon and all the fresh vegetables and the garlic. Could you also use the you, sweet potato peel to make some veggie broth? Yeah. Could kind of use any of your yeah. trimmings to make a veggie broth. Is that about right? Yeah, pretty much. Let no part go unwasted or composted and use it in your garden. Um, your sweet potatoes are going to be fully cooked. Um, Obviously, they're going to cook in the liquid whenever they stew a little bit. But this is just for the, the softer vegetables like the peppers and the onions and the garlic and to just kind of get those aromatics going. Just keep an eye on the heat so it doesn't get too hot and then you start to have stuff sticking on the bottom. And um, in a little bit, we'll add our veggie broth and our peanut butter. So peanut butter is another um, product in the supermarket that there's a lot of choices of, and it can be kind of confusing. Um, so a lot of times manufacturers, in order to make it taste better, a better mouthfeel, they'll actually add a bunch of other um, crap to it, like oils, palm oils, and sugar. Um, just to make it taste better. And that's when they end up calling it peanut butter spread. Um, so there's a certain, in order to call your product peanut butter, you have to um, have a certain amount by weight of peanuts versus all the other ingredients. So peanut butter spread, it's not something I would typically um, buy just because of all the extra added stuff. I prefer just stuff, peanut butter that just has peanuts, salt, and that's it, and they blend it up. Um, and they make ones now that you don't have to stir as much. So I know a lot of people didn't like the oil on the top, but there's, I really like Teddy peanut butter, which is um, delicious and just has salts and peanuts. And um, they're a local brand as well, which is always really nice. They have their, um, their factory up in Everett. And sometimes I'll just like bike, 
by there just so I can smell it because it smells so good during the day. Okay, so I'm going to add um, some of my veggie broth. That's a quart, which is about four cups. Turn up the heat a little bit. And then the peanut butter, which I've actually mixed with um, it's equal amounts of the boiling water, just to make it a little bit easier to kind of get in there. So it's half a cup of peanut butter and then half a cup of the boiling water that I mixed together. And you can use chunky or smooth. Um, I like chunky. I'm just going to let that mix it all up so it's nice and mixed in. And then beans. Um, I think I mentioned last time, um, also when you're in the supermarket, keep an eye on if they're low sodium versus um, regular sodium just because they can be kind of um, a power, like a just a lot of sodium in some of these cans. So I prefer to do the reduced sodium or no salt added at all. Um, just because then you can kind of choose how salty you want to make it yourself without some company doing it for you. And these are just regular black beans. I drained them a little bit and added them to it. Did you rinse them? No. Just drained them. Just drained them, just drained them from the can, yeah. So it looks a little, um, I don't know, not not the most appetizing right now, but as it cooks down, it's gonna, some of the water is gonna evaporate and it's gonna get um, a little bit thicker um, and it'll get a little bit creamier when the sweet potato starts to break down um, and all the vegetables kind of start to break down a little bit more. So I promise it will get better. So I'm just gonna turn up the heat a little bit because I do want to bring this to a boil. Roughly, also how great. Much, I'm sorry, roughly how much of the, um, how much should it cook down? Are you expecting it to be about half as liquid? No, I wouldn't say that much even. Um, maybe like a fourth cooked down a little bit. It's, I mean, it's only going to be cooking for another 25 minutes or so. I mean, you could continue to cook it and let more uh, liquid evaporate based on how thick or chunky you want it. Um, so it's kind of up to you to decide. But really just until your sweet potatoes are cooked, um, you can eat it after that point. So that takes about 25 to around 30 minutes or so. So really a preference about thickness. Yeah. Yeah, and you can also, um, you know, you can kind of, if you don't want to cook it down longer, you can also just add less um, veggie broth as well. but you still want enough to cover the potatoes so that they do cook. So going back to earlier and a complete protein, so does, is, does this dish have a complete, would you call that a complete protein? No, so this is, um, this is, because I just have the peanut butter and the beans, it's two legumes, it doesn't uh, make a complete protein. But if I were to add sun butter, which is the sunflower seed butter, that would actually be a complete protein because it's a seed. Um, but you could also just put this over like a bowl of rice or eat it with a slice of bread. But again, um, you know, if you had a grain or something else at another part of your day, then you're, you're fine because it's still going to be a complete protein overall. Okay, um, so then once it starts to heat up a little bit more, um, I'm going to add the red pepper flakes and cilantro. So I use fresh cilantro, but you could also use, um, they have dried cilantro in the grocery store, in which case you wouldn't need to use as much because it is a little bit more concentrated. Okay. 
And so really the last bit of this is just waiting for it to boil. Once it boils, you're going to bring it back down to um, probably low to medium heat and just kind of cover it and let it cook until the sweet potatoes are tender. Um, and then um, add your lime juice. So it's the juice of one whole lime, which is about a tablespoon of lime juice. Um, I prefer the fresh just because I think it tastes a little bit better than the, the bottled ones, but you can also use those as well. Um, and you can garnish it with more um, cilantro if you want, and then also add the um, brown sugar if you want a little bit of sweetness. I would recommend it um, just because it adds a really nice little touch to it. Um, and I would also definitely don't forget the lime juice because it adds a nice citrusy kick that um, really makes it just kind of finishes it off really well. And that's, that's it really. Uh, we're just going to wait for this to, to boil and that's so yeah. if you have questions for Emily about nutrition or about the recipe in uh, specifically, you can put them in the chat and we'll field those while we're waiting for it to cook down. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, it's going to be a while till it cooks down. So. <laughs> All right. Or so maybe we won't wait, maybe we won't wait the whole while. Uh, yeah. Have thoughts about other nutrition topics that would be helpful um, to hear Emily speak more about in the future. Um, we could also field those in the chat. Yeah. I'll give folks a minute. So Emily, you said you are a vegetarian, but if somebody yes. wanted to make this um, with chicken broth, or with um, chicken um, either in addition to the beans or as a replacement, um, yeah. is that possible to do? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can definitely use chicken broth as an equal substitute for the veggie broth. Um, and pro I, I mean, I haven't done it with meat, um, but it would probably be about, probably like equal weights, um, you know, of, this is almost a, like a pound of beans and maybe, you know, pound of chicken, half a pound of chicken, um, and cook that up before you, before you add it to the stew. All right, so we got a couple of questions. One is it would be good to hear more about fiber in the diet as a nutrition okay. topic. Um, another question, does rinsing canned beans get rid of some sodium? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely would um, because you're rinsing off some of the liquid that has the sodium in it. Uh, obviously, the beans are sitting in there for a while and the sodium, so they're soaking up a lot of it, but you will definitely reduce the sodium content if you do rinse them beforehand. Okay. And another topic suggestion is the benefits of organic and local on nutrition. Okay. All right. Good stuff. All right. Let's look at one more, look at your pot one more time. Yeah, it's cooking down. It's not boiling yet, but it's getting there. So roughly how you said, you said about 25 minutes in order for the sweet potatoes to be soft. Yeah, about 25 minutes after you bring it to a boil. Um, when you reduce the heat again, that, uh, it, it, but it will also depend on how thickly you cut your sweet potatoes. So you just might have to test them every once in a while just to see. But 25 is about a good amount of time. Okay, so if you cut them in a smaller dice, you could you could maybe do it faster. Yeah. All right, terrific. All right, yeah. thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Uh, seeing no further questions in the chat, we'll take those, those are great suggestions for future classes. Yeah, definitely. All right, thank you everybody.